So hi, uh, welcome to uh, session 18 uh, of our course and uh, in this course we're going to talk about uh, discipleship and um, by the way I'm sorry that I was unable to upload this uh, earlier I was really tied up with uh, a lot of things but uh, I do pray that uh, each one of you are continuing with uh, your online assignments and uh, don't uh, procrastinate or don't delay uh, because uh, we're still following uh, the same number of weeks as far as our course is concerned. And uh, so let us uh, begin by praying as we talk about uh, discipleship today. And let us ask the Lord to just bless our time. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much, O oh God, uh, for your grace, uh, for allowing us to participate, Lord, in the, in the work of making disciples uh, of all nations. Thank you, Lord, that through church planting we can do this. And so I pray, Father, that as we talk about discipleship today, that you would just enlarge our vision, help us to understand how we can uh, be more effective Lord, in this work of uh, making disciples, Lord God, of uh, various uh, people groups. So bless our time, Lord, and guide us, uh, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Now, uh, the first thing that uh, I want us to do, uh, well, of course, you, you should follow me as uh, we go through the PowerPoint, which is uh, uh, embedded on our site. Uh, first, what we need to do is just... Um, uh, review uh, so far what we have uh, studied. Uh, first of all, uh, we talked about the first two principles, and if you would recall, principle number one is Christianity is a movement, not a monument. And uh, please remember that uh, Christianity uh, is not uh, simply a, a, a static uh, thing, you know. It's not about simply putting up a church and then uh, just maintaining it. Christianity is a movement of the gospel. Uh, it's about proclaiming the good news to different kinds of people. And the second principle that uh, we talked about in our class is that if you don't go missional, you will become institutional. And that's a principle. So I hope that as you go about your church planting work, that you would remember that and uh, don't try to fall into the trap of simply just creating an institution and then ending up simply just uh, maintaining it because as like we discussed in our class, uh, that approach would uh, ultimately result in a uh, institutional and maybe ultimately a dead church. So I hope that you would not go in that route, uh, but instead uh, choose to become a missional church. Now, uh, out of those uh, two principles, we started talking about the first two steps of church planting, uh, which are, first of all, you generate uh, contact points with the lost. And you do this by trying to figure out how you can meet uh, felt needs uh, of those that you're trying to uh, target. And you prayerfully pursue uh, whatever ministry uh, might be uh, helpful uh, to try to meet their needs and which leads us to the next step which is to offer uh, God's love uh, to the lost in tangible ways. So these are the first two steps in church planting. You generate contacts uh, or contact points uh, with the lost and secondly you offer God's love in tangible ways. So I don't want you to miss uh, this very important uh, uh, step or steps rather and instead uh, make that uh, something that is constantly being done uh, even as you uh, develop your core group uh, later on or even if for example you do succeed in starting a worship service which uh, inevitably you might want to do that which is a good thing it's not bad but uh, trying to create a, an ongoing uh, outreach system is the key to uh, uh, making the church continually uh, missional uh, in its uh, practice as well as uh, in terms of its mindset. So uh, I also shared with you two other principles after this. And uh, principle number three is this, uh, the foundation and life of biblical church planting is evangelism 
and we talked about you know uh, the other option which is simply uh, probably just hiving off or just uh, you know inviting believers to join us which is easier actually but remember the key uh, to a biblical way of planting churches is to go and win people to the Lord and lead them to the saving knowledge of Jesus and the fourth principle is without a core of genuine believers there is no church so um, don't simply just aim for uh, a worship service make sure that your goal is to gather a group of believers together who will be committed uh, to each other and to the Lord of course uh, first and foremost and um, and this this is the key this is to gather a core of believers uh, and you know without a core of believers if you try to uh, start a worship service that may not be a good thing many church plans eventually fail because they try to start a worship service which is a high maintenance kind of ministry uh, too soon meaning they don't have a core of believers yet so remember that uh, do your best to try to uh, establish a core of believers and I taught you about how you can do this how to bring seekers to faith in, uh, in Christ and I told you that you uh, would most likely meet three kinds of people when you're when you're going you know when you're generating contact points uh, you'll meet uh, skeptics you'll meet spectators and you also meet seekers and uh, of course you need to focus your energy on seekers because they are the ones that uh, who would be very uh, or would be most likely um, inclined toward uh, receiving the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior now the steps toward doing that is first you begin spiritual conversations with them okay remember that and then you try to reveal your uh, personal testimony which is uh, you know, a very effective way of trying to test the water so to speak uh, to see whether a person is really being uh, formed by the Holy Spirit uh, toward uh, conversion. The third step is to invite them to study the Christian faith with you and this could be a formal study like a Bible study or a class or it could be an informal series of conversations or even just a one-time conversation. What is important is that you try to invite them and if they say yes then you are on your way to the next step which is to narrate the good news about the kingdom of God and, and the kingdom of God has to do with the transformation of the entire creation and it's coming soon in and through Jesus Christ and this is the good news because God is going to make all things new and we want everyone to repent and believe the good news that it is through Jesus Christ alone that they can enter into this kingdom and be um, one of the uh, uh, recipients of this inheritance which God has promised to those who believe. So remember the good news is not just a personal uh, transaction uh, of forgiveness which is of course part of it that's very important but uh, you must uh, try to put it in a bigger context because the forgiveness of sins uh, is really part of a larger picture and, and that is for us to be part of the, the new creation, the new heavens and the new earth someday. And uh, aside from that, uh, being forgiven of our sins uh, also leads to the transformation of our hearts which is the process of uh, uh, transformation of the process of sanctification as we would call it in theology and this sanctification has to do with uh, the formation of our souls so that God can use us uh, to uh, save others around us and um, uh, others that God is going to bring into our lives so uh, please have a bigger picture about the good news and don't just uh, limit your you're sharing to uh, you know justification uh, again I would I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying uh, justification is very very important to the gospel 
but it's just part of the gospel presentation and you must give uh, the person that you're trying to lead to Christ a, a bigger understanding a more holistic understanding of the good news and uh, so once you've done that the, the last step is to guide the seeker toward genuine conversion making sure that uh, they understand what uh, real repentance means and what trusting in Jesus as Lord and Messiah and Savior is all about. So this is what it means to bring a seeker to the saving knowledge of Jesus. Now after that, we talked about principle number five. So just follow me in, in, in the PowerPoint. Principle number five is uh, it takes a genuine community to grow a Christian okay uh, it's not enough to bring a Christian to a worship service uh, that may be the initial step but uh, stopping there would be would fall short to God's purpose for that person which is to uh, form that person into the image and likeness of Jesus so what you need to do is to uh, just bring that person into a genuine community and uh, uh, teach that person how to, to uh, build relationships with people, with fellow believers, and with others. Uh, and so principle number six is uh, assimilation is a process, uh, not an event, which means uh, this thing that we're talking about, which is you know bringing a person to genuine community, would not happen overnight. It would take uh, uh, some effort. And it's going to be a personal uh, process. We cannot uh, force this process. We have to rely on the Holy Spirit. But there are things that we need to do. And so uh, uh, as a review again, uh, let me just go through the, the acrostic join, which, is, which are the steps that we need to take to assimilate somebody uh, into the body of Christ. Uh, first of all, we need to judge if... Uh, the person uh, needs help with their conversion and we do this not just with uh, a new believer that being said of course that's uh, that's very important uh, but at the same time even if we meet let's say a believer or someone who claims to be a believer we uh, still do the same thing we try to uh, determine whether their conversion is uh, truly uh, genuine or if there's anything missing, uh, you know, do they really understand the gospel? Have they really trusted in Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior? Have they uh, uh, expressed this trust or this faith through water baptism? And have they received the Spirit of God as, as truly as a, an affirmation of God's acceptance of them into His family? So we need to check this out and we need to be very sure and if there are uh, any of those things that I mentioned uh, missing, so we need to make uh, the effort to try to help them. So the second step is to orient them uh, about the twofold purpose of salvation, which is of course to, to enjoy God forever, but also to glorify God. So this, this twofold purpose uh, process or, or rather twofold purpose okay uh, is important uh, to to explain uh, you know we are to glorify God <laughs> in this life and then ultimately we are to enjoy him forever in the new heavens and the new earth now uh, we need to clarify especially the first part uh, which is to uh, glorify God because uh, most of the time uh, when we try to share the gospel with somebody, we are simply focusing on uh, the forgiveness of sins, uh, justification, being right with God, and ultimately going to heaven, uh, which is true, especially when we are talking about, um, you know, uh, the interim period before the second coming of Christ. Uh, definitely, we if we die before the second coming of Christ, we will go to heaven to be with God and to enjoy Him forever. But that being said, uh, please uh, remember uh, that we also have the purpose of glorifying Him in whatever we do. 
And uh, as far as God is concerned, of course, His commandment is for us to, to live a life that is focused on His kingdom and to love like Jesus, to, uh, to love God with all our hearts and to love our neighbor as ourselves. So we are not simply just to wait for that day uh, for us to go to heaven. We should also be very much interested in how we can use uh, our opportunities, our talents, our capabilities, which are all gifts from God, in order to glorify uh, God. Now, the third step in, in joining believers into the community is to invite them uh, to actually join the, the ministry. And, and this may be counterintuitive for some people when they think about it because you're talking about a new believer maybe. Uh, but you see, the best way to really uh, introduce a person to the life of being a follower of Jesus, a faithful follower of Jesus, is to get that person involved immediately in doing good. Uh, goodness is the very first thing that must be added in a person's faith. And uh, this is crucial because uh, a lot of times uh, believers, uh, when they are not uh, encouraged to uh, serve the Lord as early as possible, they usually end up uh, becoming uh, mere attendees or consumers and and they begin to just miss out on God's plan for them or purpose for them to use whatever uh, they have in terms of uh, time, talents, or treasure. And so they end up unproductive, uh, unfruitful. So this is not God's will for them at all. So finally, we need to nudge them uh, to be a part of a community, to commit themselves to a local body of believers and, and not simply just to attend, not simply just to listen to sermons. Uh, in other words, not just simply to become, uh, you know, good Christians, you know, consumers whose only uh, goal in life is to receive teaching uh, but never really bear fruit. So remember that. That's not what we should be aiming for in our church planting work. So we need to go to the lost, bring seekers to uh, faith in Christ, and then uh, join them into the body of uh, believers or in the genuine community of faith so they can um, immediately uh, you know, start the, the walk or the journey of becoming faithful followers of Jesus. Now, principle number seven uh, is this. Discipleship is the purpose of all true fellowship. And we talked about that. Uh, the discipleship really is the goal why we need to come together and develop our relationships. That's really the goal of, of fellowship. It's not Fellowship is not an end in itself. Uh, the purpose is not simply to enjoy ourselves and the relationships that we have with one another. The goal of developing relationships in the body of Christ is so that there may be a conducive environment for real discipleship to happen. And we're going to talk about that in a little while. Now, principle number eight is that without accountability, uh, the community will become a fatality. Now, what we mean by that, as we talked about it in the previous session, is that um, really the key to discipleship is developing a authentic, life-giving kind of relationship with one another that is characterized by uh, accountability, uh, of our willingness to speak the truth in love with each other. Now, that's easier said than done. It's not easy. Uh, for myself, I, I know it's hard. I, I've been through uh, the, those kinds of uh, experiences, and I'm still going through them. It's not easy. It's not easy to accept uh, correction sometimes. It's not easy to uh, to be rebuked sometimes. Uh, and, and so it's important for us to be in that kind of fellowship so that uh, God may form our souls into the image and likeness of Jesus. So which brings us now 
to our topic today which is about building faithful disciples now very quickly now let's move on to this uh, first of all there are three kinds of disciples in the Bible and you may not uh, know this but uh, really disciples are not created the same as far as the scriptures are concerned uh, first of all there is what you call ordinary believers and these are, you know, the rank and file believers, the, you know, the moms and the dads and the children and so, and so forth, who are basically just called to live out uh, their lives in obedience to the gospel. Uh, they are asked to believe and to live out the gospel in the context of their daily lives. Of course, serving the Lord in one way or the other through ministry. Uh, either maybe through practical ministry among their neighbors or stuff like that. So, but this is the, the this is the first category. The second category would be the community leaders uh, 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 and workers uh, for the modality structures of the church. Now, the modality refers to the local church. Or these are the church that are in a particular place. That's why they're called modality. It's, that's a missional word. Uh, and they are appointed by the Holy Spirit to uh, oversee the communities of faith and serve various needs. So this is the third category of disciples or believers in the Lord. So there is the rank and file, and there are the overseers, the leaders, the community leaders. And then thirdly, what you'll find in the Bible is another category of disciples, and these are the missional leaders and workers, or the, you know, for the sodality structures of the church. Again, sodality is the uh, opposite of modality, and, and it's a missional kind of terminology, uh, and it refers to the church that is on mission, the church at large. These are the mobile kinds of uh, leaders. Uh, they are given by Jesus to the body of Christ uh, to, you know, plant churches, uh, equip the saints for works of ministry. These are the apostles, the, the evangelists, the, 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 the prophets. So these are the kinds of disciples that are going around. If you read, this, if you read the Bible, they're the ones who are going around visiting churches, writing letters like what Paul did and the other apostles. So these are the people who have, who have a different kind of calling as, as Christians. And so we have different, we have these three types of believers or disciples in the Bible. And um, on, you know, as, as an implication of this, let's pr try to understand uh, three mistakes that often people uh, make when it comes to discipleship. Uh, the first mistake is that we assume that everyone must do the work of the gospel. Now, I need to be very careful about this, you know, so that you don't misunderstand me. Now, I don't mean to say that uh, people should not share their faith or that they should not tell others about Jesus. What I, meant, what I mean by this is that ordinary believers are basically called to, uh, to live out their their lives uh, faithfully and basically their life is their lives are uh, are, the, are the main tool of God to proclaim the gospel to people not so much through their words but it's how they live so the second mistake uh, in relation to this is we chastise those who cannot do what we do all right we we rebuke people for not being able to do what for example, you and I, as those being trained in the ministry, uh, can do. And we need to be careful that we don't get into that kind of mistake. Uh, another is that we abuse those who do accept the challenge, and so they fail to fulfill their primary calling as an ordinary believer, uh, uh, which is to live a life of love. So. Basically, we can really be so zealous and, and not have the right kind of knowledge about what God wants to happen in the church. So, uh, we need to just understand the nature of discipleship, especially in biblical times. And uh, first of all, 
okay uh, everyone everyone in the church if you read the Bible everyone was discipled in some way and in various ways they're all discipled in some way but in various ways meaning uh, yes everyone ought to be growing as disciples of Jesus that everyone would not be have the same kind of experience okay and uh, uh, what they learned basically as we look into the scriptures what they learned uh, from God's Word uh, was lived out in and through the community of faith primarily so they basically live out their faith in the context of their relationships with one another that's why in scripture uh, we find various one another commands uh, some were trained and appointed as leaders of the community while others were trained to do missional work so what we find in scripture is that there is a majority of believers who simply are commanded by the Lord to uh, live out their faith faithfully and whatever they do they are to glorify the Lord and then they are to uh, you know love one another and they are to uh, care for each other's needs and that's basically the gospel being lived out uh, in the context of community but then there are others who are raised up they are trained to become overseers while others are trained to go out they are sent out uh, by the Holy Spirit to various places I hope that you would just think about that because in reality uh, this is something that it, that is always I mean it's quite obvious in the scriptures but often because of our traditions we fail to really notice uh, these kinds of distinctions all right we simply assume that everybody was just the same okay but in truth in the Bible the, the believers were not all of the same category so uh, all of these activities that are, are being done are part of what it means to make disciples. So, the, the you know ordinary believers being taught how to glorify God, how to take advantage of every opportunity they have, to explain the hope that they have, uh, to shine like stars, you know, and to live out their faith in the context of work or family. I mean, this is discipleship. At the same time, you know, training overseers, those who would be overseeing the church, the the elders, the, the deacons, this that's that's discipleship as well. And then those who would go out and uh, you know go to different places to start the work of God, uh, maybe in Antioch or whatever, that too is called discipleship. So all of these things are discipleship, and there is no generic. Uh, you know uh, discipleship it's just different ways for different people so the another implication here is that the personal approach of mentoring and apprenticeship uh, were reserved for those who were called uh, to missional work now again this may be very controversial but if we simply just read the scriptures as it is we would discover that uh, the kind of mentoring, you know, one-on-one -on -one kind of uh, mentoring that often we talk about these days, were really in biblical times, you know, they were really reserved for uh, those either who were really appointed for a more leadership kind of role or missional kind of role. And so it's not really for everyone, okay? What would happen usually for everyone would be they would hear uh, the reading of the scriptures, the preaching of the scriptures. Uh, they would not necessarily have that kind of one-on-one -on -one experience uh, with the apostles. So um, uh, Paul would talk about his one-on-one -on -one relationship with Timothy uh, or Titus okay, uh, or Epaphras or any of those individuals that we read about in his pastoral letters but he does not really do that with everyone okay he does mention a few names in the, in Romans 16 uh, but again it's not really for everyone okay now I know that's maybe hard to swallow 
and it's again it's contrary to what we have assumed but if we really just let the scriptures speak as it is we would see that that's really the case all right uh, some actually experience a more personal kind of mentoring while others experience a more general kind of teaching uh, from the apostles now uh, all or every type of discipleship uh, were all pleasing to God uh, you know the what I'm talking about the general teaching and preaching ministry of the apostles to all kinds of Christians that was pleasing to God uh, the what Paul talked about in Acts 20 you know as he spent time with the elders in Ephesus that's pleasing to God and also of course the, especially the you know when he mentions the time that he spent uh, with Timothy you know um, in terms of uh, being his companion as he uh, even as he went to prison prison and all of that okay that too is pleasing to God so all, all, all of these different ways uh, is pleasing to God so you know going into like if we apply it today going to seminar is pleasing to God uh, being in a discipleship group is pleasing to God um, you know going through uh, let's say a more generic kind of uh, teaching maybe you know coming to church on a regular basis that's discipleship as well so you know we can rejoice in the different ways that God is allowing us to uh, receive his word into our lives uh, we need to have all of those things you know not just one or two but all kinds of ways for people to hear God's word um, so what are the implications now okay uh, the implications are first of all we must have a bigger perspective about discipleship and not just the usual uh, material based or curriculum based discipleship now I'm not against materials I'm not saying they're wrong but discipleship goes beyond materials it goes beyond curriculum okay we may need curriculum we may need materials all right but that's more like a, a tool okay or a form uh, in which we can fulfill the function of making disciples so making disciples is the command but how we do that it could take many different forms um, we must not assume that one size fits all uh, there is no one magic program for discipleship now I'm sure there are those who would probably suggest that uh, maybe the G12 is the best method or you know purpose-driven life is better or navigators is better but all of this programs or strategies again like I was saying earlier these are just simply forms okay and, and we have the freedom to select uh, that which would be more consistent uh, with our goals you know and uh, each one of them would have pros and cons strengths and weaknesses and uh, you know one form is not necessarily better than another form of discipleship but what we need to understand are the principles okay the principles um, we must understand the principles of spiritual formation and that's the key understand the principles of spiritual formation and uh, uh, first of all God is more interested in our heart transformation uh, than in our comfort this is uh, the first principle of spiritual formation that God really is eager to develop our souls uh, I'm referring to the real us the agent the one who makes decisions that's you that's me and uh, as well as the capacities or gifts or potential that we have uh, which is unique uh, you know in God is interested that we become uh, a faithful follower of Jesus in allowing his spirit to form us from the inside out to make us more Christ-like and uh, God wants to use real life experience rather than mere man-made educational approaches 
and we're talking about trials and testings and tribulations, you know, real life experiences, as well as truth and teaching and, you know, these kinds of things. So, um, God uses, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff. And we need to be walking in the Spirit, uh, meaning uh, being open to the things that He would like to reveal to us, uh, either about Himself or the world or about us, about relationships and all kinds of things. So God uses real life. And uh, He also uses authentic relational environments to facilitate uh, heart change. And I've mentioned it not just once, I, I've talked about it several times already, that uh, we need to be uh, in, uh, in an authentic, life-giving relationship uh, where uh, people can give us feedback and we can also confess our sins and we can be honest. And um, I, I pray that uh, those of you who are really going to plant churches or me, even if you're not, uh, will really seek to, you know, be part of those kinds of environments and maybe help create those kinds of environments uh, in your church, in your ministry. Because a lot of times, uh, the reason why Christians don't really grow is because they are not in that kind of relationship at all, you know. I mean, there's no authenticity, no integrity, no willingness to speak the truth in love with each other. So that's something we need to, you know, get our hands on and be part of. And we must build a constellation of mentors and not just depend on a few uh, professional workers. Um, of course, the pastor is there to equip the saints. In fact, the fourfold ministry that is um, uh, enumerated in Ephesians 4.11 uh, they are very much needed in the church, but they are basically equipping kinds of leadership roles. And what needs to happen is the people of God should be released for ministry according to their gifts. Uh, and so that we need a constellation of mentors. Um, again, we must not be legalistic about discipleship. We must allow discipleship to happen naturally as well as formally. So, you know, uh, sometimes uh, discipleship would happen through a simple counseling session or a conversation over coffee. Or it could be more formal, like a Bible study or a class. So we should not really be boxed in. You know, we should allow the Holy Spirit to use all of these different ways and means. And uh, we must have a clear but realistic goal in our discipleship. Uh, the goal is to produce uh, faithful disciples, not perfect disciples, but faithful disciples. Uh, and he is someone or she is someone who fulfills uh, his or her, her uh, fourfold calling in Christ from the heart by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I shared with you in class what that fourfold calling is all about. Uh, first is salvation. You know, second is sanctification. Third is a situation in life. And finally, service to God. So each of these dimensions of God's purpose for our lives is something that a faithful disciple must learn and must practice. And we must invest our time and energies wisely in proportion to the type of discipleship that we are pursuing. Meaning that we cannot really give one-on-one uh, -on -one mentoring with everyone. That's not really feasible. That's not possible or even healthy. Okay, what we need to do is to select, to choose individuals that... God, by His grace, may be leading us to invest in, you know, and we choose a few of them. We cannot do this for everyone. Even Jesus could not really, uh, you know, provide one-on-one -on -one mentoring with the whole number of crowds, 5,000, 4,000. He, he cannot do that. Even Jesus cannot do that, and He did not uh, do that in that way. 
what we see in scripture and and that's why the idea of G12 caught on because it's really a biblical principle not the 12 but the idea of selecting a few and investing your life in them to uh, multiply yourself in them is a biblical idea not necessarily the number 12 okay that, that, that may be too much I think so uh, how do you do this how do you disciple you know very quickly now first you begin by establishing uh, a mentoring relationship. You, uh, you establish agreements and boundaries in terms of how you're going to relate with each other. Now, if you want to disciple somebody, you need to sit down and talk with them and say, okay, uh, I'd like to spend time with you personally to help you grow. Uh, and this is what it would entail. You know, I'd like to meet with you, you know, once a week or... I'd like us to, you know, I want you to, to call me or, or I'll call you, whatever. you. So we begin the discipleship process, uh, also called the mentoring process, by uh, talking about, you know, agreements and, and boundaries. Now, the second step is to, uh, to understand their developmental needs or where they are in the process. And we'll talk about that very quickly now. The third is... Uh, we need to instruct them according to uh, their learning style and uh, their needs. Okay, and then uh, uh, fourthly, we need to love them unconditionally, because uh, but firmly, of course, because they they will fail, They're just like you and I fail. And then finally, we need to develop them toward spiritual maturity. Now, let's just unpack that very quickly. Now, okay, uh, first of all, uh, okay. So we're talking about beginning, uh, you know, the, the, the with agreement. But uh, let's go to understanding the disciples' uh, developmental needs. Okay, uh, first, uh, you know, the first developmental need, of course, is genuine conversion. Okay, after that is growing uh, in the faith. You know, learning some very important principles about uh, spiritual formation. Uh, it's a uh, third is reproducing or reproduction, uh, where uh, a disciple learns how to, you know, uh, produce other leaders, uh, other other disciples, and then there's the maturing level, okay, and then finally the multiplying stage. So uh, at each season of a uh, disciple's life, we need to be sensitive to their needs and find out how we can help them move to the next season of their journey okay so we need to instruct them also okay once we know what they need we need to move them from point a to point b and we take note of their learning style which could be auditory you know basically based on hearing uh, visual you know what they see or kinesthetic you know they just want to you know, do things or be part of something or some kind of combination of these things. And uh, we need to be sensitive about that. You know, how can I teach a disciple? How, let's say I'm discipling somebody. Okay, how, what is the best way? And it's not always that the, the best way would be your way. Like, if I love reading, it does not necessarily mean that everyone loves reading. Okay, you know, sometimes people would rather just talk or people would just rather watch. So we need to be sensitive, you know, as to the different ways that a person may learn. And then we need to love them unconditionally but firmly because, uh, you know, we need to encourage, encourage disclosure or honesty. We need to provide appropriate feedback whenever necessary, you know, praises or corrections. Uh, we need to apply mutual accountability. So we also need to be open you know not just us doing the the correcting for example so overall i want you to remember a very important principle in discipleship and, and it is this a mature disciple or a faithful disciple is someone who lives and, and loves uh, like jesus you know you live and love like jesus and ultimately it's what discipleship is all about so I hope that you are able to grasp uh, these this principles and 
So you, to recapitulate, you know, you go to a target area, you establish relationships, you try to identify seekers, then you bring them to the saving knowledge of Jesus. And once you've done that, you join them into a community of faith. And once they are there, that's the time that you begin to challenge them to be a part of the ministry so that you can then move on to discipleship where you uh, begin to have a, a mentoring relationship with them and you help them through the process until they develop into spiritually mature followers of Jesus. So that's it. So that's, uh, I know it's a bit long, but I hope that you'll just meditate on this. You can go back to, uh, you know, whatever part of the video that you don't understand. And uh, what is important is you get you grasp really the principle that I'm sharing with you. And um, I'll try to finish the other sessions, okay, within this week so that uh, you can uh, listen to them as well. So enjoy. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you for your patience. Uh, do pray for me that I can finish the last two sessions uh, as soon as possible. Goodbye.